Hello, I'm Gary Stearman. Today's guests are going to share with me a topic that, well, a little bit off the beaten path, but you're going to find it really interesting. We'll be right back. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Bob Ulrich, Gary Stearman's partner and the co-founder of Prophecy Watchers. I would love to tell you how you can become a subscriber to our wonderful Prophecy Magazine, creatively named The Prophecy Watcher. And ready for this? How you can get eight powerful Prophecy DVDs as a free bonus for subscribing today. Every day, the ancient prophecies of the Bible get more and more exciting as we watch world events come into perfect alignment with the words of the ancient prophets. Examine the pre-trib rapture doctrine taught by the Apostle Paul. Come to a deeper understanding of the giants of Genesis 6 and the real reason for the flood of Noah. Read the shocking things we see coming out of the world of science and technology, mind-blowing advances in transhumanism and artificial intelligence. Keep a close eye for a series of wars coming very soon to the Middle East. The Bible's a supernatural book, and we enjoy covering the fringe subjects and dark corners of Scripture as well. UFOs, the Nephilim, the miracles of the Bible, and so much more. It's a one-of-a-kind publication full of articles that will make you a Bible prophecy expert and prepare you for the future. We have a very special subscription offer for you today. For your gift of $50 or more to support the worldwide outreach of Prophecy Watchers, you can subscribe to either the digital version or the print version of our magazine. And here's the best part. In addition to receiving 12 monthly issues of the magazine, this offer comes with a fantastic bonus. Eight DVDs from some of the leading prophecy experts in the world today. Eight DVDs plus 12 issues of the magazine represents a $200 value. But it's available today for your gift of just $50 or more to support the work of Prophecy Watchers. This offer is available anywhere in the USA and will ship both the magazine and the DVDs absolutely free. Don't wait or hesitate. Call the toll-free number on your screen or visit our online bookstore at prophecywatchers.tv to take advantage of this limited time offer. Looking at the future through the lens of Bible prophecy is the entire focus of this ministry. We're motivated like never before by our desire to tell the world that Jesus is the only answer for these troubling times. And we do believe that he's coming back very soon, just as he promised. Partner with us today. Help us take God's message of salvation through Jesus Christ to the whole world. I'm looking forward to this one because we're going to talk about a subject I dare say that we have never broached before. The book, Do Our Pets Go to Heaven? And you may say, wait a minute, is that worthy of discussion? I think you will agree with me that it is after we get into it. And you know, let me start by saying, Joe and Tom, let me just say that I, in my opinion, the fastest growing subject maybe in the United States today is people and their pets. There are pet shops, pet stores, pet products of all kinds. Pet foods are branching out. There are specialty stores. Uh, I think that pet ownership is becoming a really big deal. Uh, who would like to weigh in, in on this uh, at the beginning? Well, I'll jump in, Gary, and just say <clears throat> thanks for having us on to talk about this. Kind of brave of you to broach the subject of well, do our pets go to heaven? When Tom uh, uh, said, would you like to talk about pets going to heaven? My first response was, well, how can we link this to Bible prophecy? And Tom rattled off a half a dozen topics. And I, well, you know, this it might well be worthy of discussion. And let's just talk about animals in the Bible. And it's a subject that we really don't talk about, but it's in Genesis with Adam. It goes all the way to Revelation with the uh, the creatures called cherubs, the cherubim around God's throne, have the faces of animals. And once I began to, to think about this subject a little bit, suddenly it opened up, and wow, there's a lot there. And there's a lot there that's directly tied to prophecy. Uh, for instance, in Romans, it talks about the future, right? And how all of creation is groaning and travailing under this current curse of sin that also began in the book of Genesis. Um, in Isaiah, it talks about, now some people think that Isaiah is describing the future millennial reign of Jesus Christ, that thousand year period, right, that's going to follow 
the great tribulation period. Well, that's all Bible prophecy. And yet when you read Isaiah, he refers over and over again to animals in the future and how they'll be different in the future mm -hmm. uh, as a result of these prophetic developments uh, on earth. He describes carnivores that are now herbivores. Can you imagine that? Lions that are eating grass with oxen. Yeah. It talks about little children leading them about and children, a little child playing on the whole of what it, of course today would be a poisonous asp, a deadly snake, but in that day won't be. And but they'll still be present. In other words, God sees a need for the animal kingdom in, in ways that we don't usually think about. And so there you have it the prophetic view of animals. And honestly, until I had looked at this book, I, I never really thought about these things. Yeah, absolutely. And not just dogs, of course. Joe is an animal behaviorist. He works primarily with dogs. But this would be true for somebody who's got a kitty kitty or a pony or whatever, yeah. that uh, animals are included in the scripture in great detail. For instance, notice when uh, the flood has receded, and God makes a covenant with Noah. But notice when you go and read that text, over and over again, he says, I am making this covenant with you and with the beasts that are with you. And he repeats that over and over again. And it's kind of eye-opening, really. God is making a covenant, not just with Noah, but with the animals that are with him too. Um, you can see this in the book of Genesis where God names Adam. But then he brings the animals in, and he has Adam name all of the animals. And you notice that when God makes a covenant, he often renames the individual. In fact, he says of all of us that he's going to give us a new name yes. in heaven. So this is part of the covenant relationship that God has with us, and yet he passes on this responsibility to Adam in the Garden of Eden. And that's partly why guys like C.S. Lewis and others believe that when you bring a pet out of the wild, it's no longer just out there running around the wild. You bring it into your home and you give it a name. The pet learns to know its name and according to Lewis and other theologians, it then gets its identity or what we might also call soul. It becomes a personality. And Lewis believed, and there's a great deal more to that theology that we talk about in Do Our Pets Go to Heaven that we don't have time to do today, but he believed that that was key to answering this question, mm. which is a question I was asked many times as a pastor, and I know you have been too. Do our pets go to heaven? Uh, Terry James, Tom Horn uh, have put together this book, but the foreword in it, which by the way I really love, is written by Joe Artis. And, and Joe, in, in humorous language, and uh, the language of having experienced something, tells about his, uh, how, can I ex how can I explain this properly? <laughs> his coming to understand animals uh, in a close personal way, which really you had never done before. No, I actually uh, spent a lot of years, um, I, I had a lot of phobias about germs and anything with fur, so the <laughs> decision to bring an animal into my home and coexist, uh, I actually looked at the people that did as, as kind of like, you know, it didn't make sense to me. <laughs> this was not a realm that I would have personally um, adventured into. But my, the three beautiful, important women in my life, my wife and my two daughters, kind of worked on me, and it took a couple of years, but they finally got me to agree to bringing home a puppy, and things changed in my home <laughs> right away. Yeah, you've got to read Joe's uh, description of the puppy and his getting used to it. But there's a, a deeper aspect to all this. There is, there is. Uh, I actually started to realize that applying human psychology, talking to the dog like I would as if it were my child, didn't work. Hmm. The dog simply wouldn't follow my instructions. And so I, I called a, a dog behaviorist expert who came into my home to assess the situation. And lo and behold, Gary, I found out that you can't talk to your dog <laughs> like you do a child and expect to see results in the same way. And so I've found that, uh, you know, rather than me training the dog, the dog has actually been teaching me a great deal. You find out that dogs won't follow poor energies like uh, anger or frustration. When you yell at your dog, they don't respond to that. And so having the dog in our home and in our lives has made all of us, including my wife and kids, check our energy, you know, our attitude, the way we approach things and the way we communicate with the dog. So we've had to daily practice better behaviors like positive, calm assertion, you know, peace of mind, 
uh, to provide the kind of leadership that the dog will follow. So it's it's been a very rewarding experience and a very eye-opening experience. Now, as you uh, were talking, I was thinking about uh, a, a Bible verse, and, and I read this before we came on the uh, program today, and, and, and I really want to read this again because I hadn't looked at this closely until I considered the book. <clears throat> it's about what God said after he created Adam. In Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it's not good that a man should be alone. I'll make him a help meet mm -hmm. for him. And what comes into your head immediately is, oh, that's Eve. But no, you read on. And out of the, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So you say, okay, well, now it's time for Eve. Well, the next verse says, And Adam gave names to all the cattle and the fowl of the air to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. And then we come to Eve, after all the animals have been created. Now, I don't know what that says about women, but... <laughs> <laughs> or what that says about Joe, but this this little puppy that became a monstrosity for a while till he learned how to communicate with it, ultimately, though, was a helpmate. Helped him be a better father, as I've understood, you know, my conversations with him. A better dad, he's more temperament now. So, and you could extrapolate that out to how yeah. many kinds of ways today are we using animals, horses, cats, mm -hmm. dogs, whatever. You have children that have been abused that won't open up to another human. They don't trust them. But these animals can be used to bring healing back to their lives. Soldiers that have post-traumatic stress syndrome are being helped a great deal with animals today. So there is this use of them. We could, we could even say it is a ministry. And many people have a ministry where they're actually using God's creation to accomplish these eternal type of uh, benefits. And, and Gary, I was a pastor for almost 25 years. And I know you've probably had the same thing come up as a pastor. Oh, yes. And that is when somebody at your church comes up to you and they're very sincere. And sure. sometimes they're almost embarrassed to ask the question, right? Sure. But they wanna know, will my pet be in heaven? And that was part of the reason why we ultimately wound up writing this book. It does also <clears> connect <throat> to prophecy, but there's even a bigger question on, on a lot of people's mind this pet that means a lot to them. Sometimes people are in situations where they don't have much human interaction or they're senior retired and nobody comes around anymore. Right. And that pet begins to mean a great deal to them. It is their constant companion. It gives them love and affection. It receives their <laughs> love and affection. And they're very sincere when they ask, will my pet be in heaven? So I found as a pastor a point where I had to really start thinking about this one day, not just fluff it off, but try to come to a conclusion in my own mind about whether or not I thought pets would be in heaven. And I should also say, a lot of great theologians down through time, we've done shows in the past, Earth's Earliest Ages, where we talk about you know, the great turn of the century preacher, George Hawkins Pember. A lot of people don't know, he wrote a book on animals in the future. He concluded that animal pets will be in heaven. C.S. Lewis, the same way. There's a lot of modern preachers, uh, Billy Graham, Randy Alcorn wrote a book on heaven in which he argues that they will be in heaven. So, but then the question is, why would they believe that? And surprisingly, there's actually some kind of deep theological discussions that are taken right out of the scripture that have led some to believe that uh, pet animals, those that are brought back under man's dominion, not just every animal that's running around out in the wild, but specifically those that are under man's dominion, they make the case that they uh, most likely will be in heaven. We should say that there's no single verse in the Bible that says, oh, by the way, your pet is yeah. going to be in heaven. But there's reasons many people believe that they will. Well, you know, the wolf, for example, running around in packs, and we've all seen uh, specials on television about what wolves do in the wild. But, but in fact, I, it's my understanding that all dogs are variations of breeds that, that originated in the wolf community. And how different an animal becomes when it is bred and trained to live among human beings. It's, a, it's amazing. And that takes us right back to Adam, uh, where God said, I, I want to create these animals to be suitable helpers for you, Adam. And that's what they were. And it's not long ago that horses were our only means of high-speed cross-country transportation, you know? But again, <clears throat> consider prophecy. In the future, horses are going to be our high-speed form of communication again. 
because Jesus and the armies of heaven return on horseback. Now, why? I mean, we could have come floating in on lightning bolts or on clouds or, right? Uh, yeah. Some surprising new kind of high tech that God would have invented, but he chose horseback. God notes the fall of even the tiny sparrow. Now, that's amazing to me that, that the love of God extends all the way down to the lower members of the animal kingdom. And, and that's really hard for me to grasp in a way. I'm like you, Joe, maybe before your eye-opening <laughs> experience, because I tend to be so busy, I say to myself, well, there's no time in my life for a pet. I, just, I couldn't possibly take care of one because I just don't have the time and so forth and so on. There may be a lot of reasons why we don't have pets, but on the other hand, if you begin to open your mind to the fact that God created these animals for a reason, it's something that I had not considered, and, and this book brought it back to my mind again. Again, the, the name of the book, is, by the way, is Do Our Pets Go to Heaven? And the foreword in it is by Joe Artis, animal behaviorist. <laughs> you really have come to take all this seriously. In other words, you started out saying, I don't know about this dog thing, and you have gone 360, I mean 180 degrees. I really have. I've kind of gone from both ends of the spectrum now, from, from the guy I, I totally identify with the people that, that, that feel as I did at one time, you know, where, where the, the, the idea of being licked or having dog hair on your <laughs> yeah, coat, yeah. It's, just, it's just too much, from totally embracing the lessons that I've been able to learn and, uh, you know, schooling and educating and studying the psychology behind why an animal or, or more specifically a canine companion thinks the way that they do. You've got this huge uh, bull mastiff dog, right? Yeah. Yes. And she takes <clears throat> it to give it its food. Now, people always say, you better be careful, you know, get around a big dog and get around his food plate. You'll see a little bitty girl. What is she, maybe like four years She's four old? four years old. Four years old, and she comes up and tells this dog to stop. She puts his food and stuff right in front of him, and the dog watches her. And it is not until this little four-year-old girl points at that and says, okay, that he understands that he now can go and eat. And uh, this is the kind of a dog that would never bite a child who gets too close to its plate because he understands the food's not his. Right. The food is yours, and you've only given, given him permission to partake of it. So it's this, it's this very strange dog whispering kind of thing you know, that <laughs> I can't do, but I'm very thankful I have access to somebody that can make my dog uh, behave. But back to Genesis, one of the reasons why some of these guys like Billy Graham uh, and others believe that pets will go to heaven is a very simple piece of kind of thinking in that they look at Genesis and it says that God created all these animals and then he looked at them and what does he say? It is very good. And the Hebrew there is ta'ud, and it implies that God made this not just to be a helpmeet for Adam, but he made it for his own pleasure. There's a lot right. of other places in Scripture that reflect that too. Um, he made it for himself. He looked at it. He said, it's very good. It makes me happy. It's exactly what I wanted it to be. Now, what a guy like Graham would say is, if you say that as a result of the fall, that God forever lost and now cannot redeem back to himself what he wanted in the first place, then in essence what you're saying is the devil triumphed over God, at mm -hmm. least in some measure, in the fall in the garden. And so it's a very simple kind of logic that says, that's why Romans says that the creature groans and travails, waiting for that day to wit the redemption of the sons of God, when it too will be redeemed. So that's one of their points. Mm. There's many numerous other places in Scripture that when you look at it like they do, it just does tend to make a lot of sense. At least, at least it lends credibility to this idea that our pets could be in heaven. Well, I'd like to take a moment to get myself out of trouble here because I mentioned a minute ago that God created the animals first and then Eve. I just want to say he saved the best for the last. <laughs> <laughs> Very important note. That was smart, Gary. Yeah. That's, that's right. But let's talk about prophecy now. A and when I think of animals... And, and you and I have had this conversation, at least in part, but let's have the full conversation right now. There are creatures in heaven called cherubs or cherubim that surround the throne of God. And one of them has the face of an eagle. You know, one has the face of a lion. One has the face of a bovine animal, a cow. One has the face of a man. And so these, I call them guardians around the throne of God. Some call them watchers around the throne of God are representatives of different kingdoms, apparently. 
And three of them represent the animal kingdom. One of them represents the human kingdom. Uh, there's something going on here, prophetically speaking, that I'm not sure we've fully explored. Yeah, and, and I've, I've heard that described. And actually, I have to say, Gary, I want to give you credit for something. There was a show people pro probably can go back in the archives and watch where we had a discussion on what you call the fifth watcher. And I have to say that that was a day when my eyes were opened and it tied a great deal of different aspects of earth, of geology, these, these prehistoric bones as we call them, you know, the dinosaurs, the great terrible lizards and whatever. Um, and I don't know if we have time or if you even want to get involved in that discussion on this show, but it was very meaningful to me to understand that these, these living beings in heaven might have been given the responsibility of watching over different kingdoms or aspects on earth. So the, the, the angelic being with the face of an eagle perhaps mm -hmm. is overlooking the, the animals that have the ability of flight or birds right. or something like that. The bovine maybe work animals or, or animals that provide milk and cheese and whatever mm -hmm. to humans, sure. right? The lion may be more the predatory, but, but they, <clears throat> they had these responsibilities for overseeing them. But then there was the possibility of this fifth watcher. Who was that oh. watcher that would have been overlooking the reptilians that are all dead now? Yeah, he was called Halel, which translated into the uh, our Bible as Lucifer, who was a watcher who's called a serpent, which means that he had the face of a serpent, and it stands to reason that he was the watcher over the serpent kingdom, which used to be the dominant kingdom on the face of the earth. But now it's reduced to very diminutive stat stature, that is to say, turtles and lizards and snakes. And I suppose the biggest uh, serpent on the face of the earth now is the Komodo dragon. But he's nothing like the ancient dinosaurs that used to be 100 feet long. And what's interesting, Gary, to me, this is one of the lights that went on, is because our best scientists say that the, the best evidence suggests that something a long time ago impacted the earth. And that is what killed the dinosaurs. And so they'll say, maybe it was a meteor or something like that. Yet Jesus in the New Testament says, I behold Satan like lightning fall from the heavens. And the day you brought that up, I thought, wow, I mean, now that really makes a great deal of sense that this overseer, this watcher, who would have been yeah. overseeing the reptilian kingdom was kicked out of heaven, falls to the earth, and together with him has destroyed that kingdom over which he was responsible. And now we're touching on prophecy. Let's go on and, and let's then delve into where we are right now, having kind of established a basis for man's relationship with the animals. Uh, Joe, you couldn't stand a dog licking you. You've probably uh, come to a, a different level of understanding, and you've obviously developed a relational uh, kind of a quality to your uh, appreciation of animals. And it's one that I, I have to confess that I don't have at this point. I identify with people on both sides. And yes, an, you know, canine companions have taught me more than I'll ever teach them back. Um, you see the genius in the creation of them, giving God all of the glory for the way that he designs animals to respond to human behavior, to teach us lessons about the way that we carry ourselves and the kinds of you know, mindsets that we choose to take. You know, a lot of days you wake up, you're having a hard time, or maybe you got a lot in your mind. And if you want to influence a canine companion, for example, you have to make daily decisions to be in a, in a, in a healthier frame of mind if you want to influence the behavior. So they make us better in that respect. Um, it's, it's interesting, you opened the program and you talked about the increase of the number of people now that are, you know, you said there's, there's, there's stores everywhere, boutiques yeah. and, and products and stuff. And I, I, I wondered when you said that, I'd been wondering this earlier, if we're not seeing kind of an explosion in the, in the increase in the number of people taking an interest in animals because there's something there that in the, in the turbulent times that we live in, mm -hmm. if there isn't a layer there of companionship, maybe they can't even put their, their finger on it, but they wow. just find that they feel better. That's a great thought when they're hanging out with the animal or there's something that like having that unconditional love with a dog, you know, you come home no matter what the dog views you as its King, right? Yeah. There's something about that bond that sometimes for some people is more rehabilitating 
and it feeds the person more than sometimes, in some cases, the, the relationships that they don't have with humans. Well, that goes back to Adam, because God said he, he's, he made the animals as suitable helpers for Adam, which means that they would have been tuned, tuned into each other, I suppose. In, in fact, before the fall, there was probably a very close relationship between Adam and the animals, and maybe Christians can begin to move animals back in that direction again. Well, certainly we should. I mean, we, we won't have time during this show to talk about the great theology of C.S. Lewis and why he believed. He wrote a book called The Problem of Pain. Yeah. Uh, and in the final chapter of that, he deals with pain that animals suffer, and then he talks about their death, and then he gets over onto this subject matter of, and will they be in heaven? And uh, I would just recommend people read this book where we talk about what C.S. Lewis believed. They can get that book from you. And one quick addition to that, Gary, I know we're going to run out of time, but if God has heavenly beings watching over these animals, it once again illustrates that he himself has chosen not just to create them, mm -hmm. but to care for them. Uh, Proverbs 12 actually says that a person who doesn't take care of their animal well is considered unrighteous by God but that the person who treats their pet well is considered by him to be righteous. Hmm. So in the way that we consider God to be benevolent and he watches over us, God expects us, having been created in his <clears throat> image, to treat those that are under us, including our animals, yeah. in the same way as benevolent. Well, back to Joe for a moment. Joe, as a Christian, you know, and having undergone this transformation, and, and then become really closely involved, particularly with dogs, uh, do you see a, like a spiritual application here? Does, does that come through all this? Yes, I do. I didn't see it at the beginning, but, but now I realize that, you know, as I've learned how dog psychology works, they won't follow energies or leaders like, you know, that, are, that use anger or, or frustration to try to influence their behavior. And so to influence a dog to provide you with the kind of positive behavior that you want to see inside of your home, it makes you practice better decisions about how to carry yourself. You know, they like to follow a leader that's calm, one that's relaxed, one that's positive. And so, and so to, to coexist with a canine companion and to do it well, it kind of puts you in a position where you have, you have a situation where if you want to influence the dog for good, you yourself have to be positive and relaxed. And, and so it, it makes you practice better frames of mind. You know, as you're talking, the whole subject of service dogs came into my mind. You know, d uh, the dogs for the blind, for the hearing impaired, uh, for, for people who Absolutely. are uh, hospitalized, so forth. Uh, returning veterans, tell, say a word or two about that. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of army veterans that return home, that have put up walls, that have a hard time communicating with loved ones because the action they've seen t to them is so dark and so difficult to talk about. Mm. Uh, becomes a situation where they're they're uh, they're they're psychologically traumatized to a degree that that when ten step programs and human psychology has failed to rehabilitate them long term, uh, when provided with a service dog, for example, that is their loyal companion who's there to to be with that person in ways that that human language can't even comprehend. Hmm. In many cases, those dogs are are a segue. To, to teaching the, the, the soldier that's been traumatized to communicate again. It gives him a purpose. He begins to love again. The, 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 the dialogue begins to open again. Then he's able to start outreaching wow. and include loved ones again. And it's, 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 it's almost miraculous. It is miraculous. Mm -hmm. When you see the genius of the way that God created animals in ways that people take for granted every day. But just add one quick thing, Joe. That was a genius thought. But Gary and I have done shows on how as a result of our technology, society today is becoming really uh, fragmented. We don't have these old conversations like we mm -hmm. used to have, long conversations. Yeah, right. Communities don't get together around their dinner tables and talk and converse and develop relationships. It's all very fast. It's, uh, it's internet-based. It's too easy to say something cruel about somebody and walk away because you're not facing them face-to-face, -face, developing a yeah. relationship. And maybe you're right. Maybe part of why... Yeah this explosive growth around animals has something to do with something that's needed uh, within our souls. You know, people lament the fact that we text each other, even if we're standing in the same room, but you can't text your dog. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a different kind of a relationship. It's a, uh, 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 there's a feeling involved there or an appreciation. 
And I hadn't even really considered this until I'm sitting here right now and all of a sudden this whole world is opening up. We're down to the last three minutes of our program and, and suddenly I figured out how, what we need to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> People come to me, and, and you mentioned this a minute ago, as a pastor, and they, they have said, is my dog, which by the way, a recently deceased dog, this happens all the time, going to be in heaven? And you know, I have not known what to say until this very moment. And now I, I think I'm better prepared to answer that question, guys. I really do. Well, now you can just give them the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, read this so if book. You disagree, disagree with those guys, right? Yeah, it's fascinating. And, you know, we're approaching the rapture of the church. We're approaching a time when uh, this world's going to be judged and there will be a kingdom era uh, in maybe just a few years from now. The Lord will come back. He'll establish the throne of David. <clears throat> He'll be seated there and there will be true peace around the world for the first time. It's going to last for a thousand years. Animals in that period, according to Isaiah, according to Ezekiel, animals are going to be a whole different phenomenon. They're going to be as God intended, right? Absolutely right. And one final word on prophecy. Yeah. Animals are commanded in Psalms to praise the Lord. And in the book of Revelation, they're described as praising the Lamb that sits upon the throne forever and ever. Wow. So once again, prophecy. This is fascinating to me. And let me just mention that uh, we're going to offer you, and right now, uh, well, I'll just go ahead and do it. The title of the book is Do Our Pets Go to Heaven? Uh, it's a collaboration with Terry James, Tom Horn, and Joe Artis, animal behaviorist. Got the 800 number on your screen right now. And I think you might be interested in this, even if you didn't uh, at first kind of react to Do Our Pets Go to Heaven? Throughout time, one question has puzzled humanity. What's really behind the relationship between humans and animals? Does the bond bear significance in our walk with God? How do you find peace when you've lost a beloved pet? Do our pets go to heaven? Learn the amazing facts behind what the Bible has to say on this subject as you journey with animal behaviorist Joe Artis, prolific writers Tom Horn and Terry James, as well as other thoughtful contributors as they recount the amazing tales of pets that saved lives, animal companions that helped with healing, and what God himself has to say about the redemption of his beloved creation. Well, Tom, I appreciate your being here. Joe, uh, you, you may have converted me. <laughs> <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> it's fascinating to talk uh, to a couple of guys who are godly men who have integrated that godly spirit into their daily lives, even to the point of, of understanding the relationship between humans and animals as God intended originally. I'm Gary Stearman. Tom, it's always great to have you here. And, uh, and Joe, I appreciated talking with you, too. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. God bless you guys. And uh, hey, we're watching. Why don't you keep watching, too? <laughs>